Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Author Spotlight. This is Taj Deshaun, Vice President of Self Publishing 30 Days. I'm here today with Dr. Gregory Charlotte. What's going on, Dr. Greg? Hey, not much, man. Good to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. Got the book right here, Why Dr. Skip Breakfast. This book has been a game changer for me, uh, teaching me a bunch of new information, but also reaffirming some of the things that I've already been doing. I'm like, hey, if Dr. Greg says it's okay, then that means I'm <laughs> on the right track. We're going to get into, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Gregory in a second. Uh, but before we dive in, I'm going to give this man a quick introduction, just so you know who you're dealing with here. We got a heavy hitter on the show. I'm going to let you guys know right now, you might want to get your notepad ready uh, as you're listening to this, because there's going to be a lot of information that you're going to want to incorporate into your diet, your health, just your overall well-being. But before we get into that, Dr. Gregory, Dr. Gregory Charlotte is a wellness physician who's been featured on ABC, Fox, and CBS. He trained at Stanford and founded the first and only site dedicated to the health of retired and current athletes. You can check out more about what he's up to, get some wellness tips that are geared, geared towards athletes at retiredathletehealth.com. But I just want to dive in, Dr. Greg, because I know that uh, this is, I want to hear directly from you. You have an amazing background before you move to Texas, which you and I might be neighbors very soon, you know, <laughs> before that, I know you, uh, you, you've had an awesome career, even before you started working with athletes, working with celebrities. Can you just give the listeners a little bit of background around like what happened after you were training at Stanford and how you kind of launched your career and uh, just leading up to everything you're doing now? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks for having me on the show. It's great to be here. And I love the work that you guys are doing. Thank so you, a little thank bit you. about me. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. And, you know, and you're doing all these different things, which I think is great, you know, with like writing and with with athletes and, and you're, 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 you're doing some impressive stuff. So I, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. I received that. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled for you to be on the show, honestly, because I mean, I know that this, this episode is going to serve a lot of different people. Um, and once again, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I know you're going to get into your story, but I do want to say very quickly, this is also going to be posted on the Thrive After Sports podcast. And a lot of athletes that I've worked with over the years, one of their main things is they get out of shape because no one's blowing the whistle for them anymore. So the work that you're doing for athletes, I think is huge because I've pointed a lot of people in your direction. Um, just like, hey, you need to check out what, what Dr. Greg is doing, or I'll send them a copy of the book. Just like, incorporating that into my coaching because I think that that physical fitness part is, is tied into the wellness part of it so you know I, I just really think that your work is awesome and uh yeah if you could please just please tell uh, listeners a little bit about your background and how you got to this point doing all this awesome work sure sure so you know I'm from California and so after I was done training I worked at a large hospital in northern California in Oakland for about 14 years and you know, I was just taking care of really sick patients. I'm an anesthesiologist by training. So we'd take care of babies and infants and kids and adults who needed all kinds of surgeries. And it's a big hospital, it's a busy place. And so one of the things is, you know, I love medicine. I, I love working in the operating room, but I guess I'm one of those kind of like restless people, I, kind of like you, I think that, you know, I like to do <laughs> different things and, you know, I don't, I don't want to just do one thing. And so I've been doing that for a long time. And while I was there, uh, they had a rule. I couldn't do medical stuff that wasn't with the hospitals, like these non-compete things, you know? And so I got involved in real estate and I actually started a couple of real estate startups to help uh, seniors and disabled people find alternative housing. And I, this is an author show. So I wrote my first book actually about real estate because I was into that and it was kind of fun and all real estate technology and everything. And it didn't violate, you know, my non-compete thing with the hospital. But then after being there, and we'll probably get into this later, I, I decided to leave uh, a little over a year ago. And, you know, I wanted to try something else and I didn't want to be stuck there. And I'm really into health and wellness. And I, I've been into it since I was a kid, honestly. And so I left and I wrote the book that you're talking about, Why Doctors Skip Breakfast, which is all about anti-aging medicine. And I did that when I moved to Beverly Hills. And while I was there, I got involved in all these plastic surgery offices. So I became kind of the anesthesiologist to the stars down in Beverly Hills. And so I was taking care of all these Instagram celebrities and, and actresses and things like that, who you know wanted to get facelifts and breast implants and everything. 
And so it was fun because I was working on anti-aging medicine and I was starting my telemedicine business and I was taking care of all these celebrities down in Beverly Hills. And it was a great experience down there. And while I was there, I, I got connected sort of with the athlete scene and I, you know, met a bunch of athletes and, you know, I'd always loved watching sports, but I didn't know personally that many athletes. But while I was there, I met a bunch of them and I learned that the athlete experience is not kind of what you maybe think it is, you know, it's not it just, you know, flying off, you know, in a helicopter from one thing to something else. And, you know, a lot of athletes, they struggle with a lot of the very medical problems that I was interested in, you know, and a lot of them struggle with weight and they struggle with concussions and they struggle with everything. And so I thought, well, this is really great because I'm interested in this topic. I think a lot of these people need the type of help that I'm into. And that's kind of where it the sort of athlete thing came from. So it was, it was a great experience. And now I'm in Texas. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's awesome. And I, I love the fact that you, you realized that you were kind of boxed in, like working at the hospital, like you said, so you decided to leave because you had that itch to serve more people. And as you were starting to get into working with athletes, like and I love the fact that you decided to write a book because although the book, Why Doctors Skip Breakfast is about anti-aging, like you said, it's not necessarily geared towards athletes. However, it does serve the athlete community, right? So I'm reading it as an athlete and I'm just eating this stuff up because it affects my post-athletic life. You know, was that kind of like, and you wrote a book about real estate first, which is interesting. So once you decided to kind of branch off and, and really go hard with the anti-aging route, you decided to write another book. Like, why do you think it's important or what, what has being an author done for you just as far as your, your, your areas of expertise, especially since you have multiple? Well, I think being an author is great. And, and I'll be honest with you, if I could do anything and I knew that I could make a living and definitely off it, it would mostly be writing. Like I love, I love writing, I love writing books. I mean, it's a lot of work, but, and, and now that I've done it a couple of times, I know it's a lot of work. But it's fun, you know, it's fun because you're, you're creating something. And, and, and to be honest, you know, one of the big things I didn't like about working in the hospital is it's, it's not that creative. You know, you, mm -hmm. you're using your brain a lot, you're thinking, you're dealing with difficult situations, but you're not really creating anything. You know, there's kind of like a best way to do things and that's what you do. And what I liked about writing a book is you actually, you get to use your mind in a different way to figure out what you like, you know, you're the writer, so you're the boss. Like you could write about whatever you want to write about, whatever is interesting to you, whatever catches your eye, it could be a little specific topic or a big topic. And, and you get to decide what you wanna write about it. And then you do research and, and I loved it. And I like, I guess, coming up with words and restructuring sentences. I mean, even the editing process, I, I like. And so I think writing is a lot more fun than, than most other things, to be honest. And it, it's, I guess, just because you're creating a real thing that, and, you know, I, you and I are sitting here today and we're talking, but there could be someone, you know, in England who's reading the book right now and they may be getting something out of it. And that's just an awesome thing, I think. And it's different than if you're working in a hospital where the only person you're dealing with is whoever's right in front of you right at that moment. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. One of the things I love most about your book, Dr. Greg, is that it's in your voice. Uh, like, I feel like I can almost hear your voice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because some people, you know, it's, it's almost disconnected, their writing style, or I don't know, we read some books where when I read your book, I can tell that you enjoy writing it is what I'm really getting at. And, you know, we work with a lot of people who they don't consider themselves good writers. And that's something I encourage because we have a system to obviously put them in a place where they can write comfortably. And there's a way to do it where you can write from your own voice. And from there, that's when it starts to become fun. You know, and like you're talking about, you're able to enjoy the creation process, the editing, the restructuring, because you're putting your voice out there, you know. Um, now I want to dive back into the contents of the book for a second, like just I'm working with a lot of athletes. There's all these different trends. People don't know who to listen to, what to believe, what's good, what's bad. I'm just going to start right out the gate with intermittent fasting because that's a big one, right? And that's something I've been practicing myself. Can you just speak to 
you know, maybe just it'll be better for them to hear from you, like giving an actual breakdown of what intermittent fasting is. And then can you go into some of the benefits of it as well? Yeah, absolutely. And before I get to that, though, I just want to say, like, I your thing about speaking in your voice, I totally agree with you. And, you know, I look at my favorite authors and I could tell if you just took a few pages and I hadn't read the book, I know that I would be able to identify them because they, they write a certain way, you know, and I and I like it and it makes you kind of feel like, you know, the writer. They're not just regurgitating information, but you, you know who's talking to you. And I, I think that that's what people want. You know, I don't think people want in a book just to get information. I mean, yes, you want to get information, but you kind of want to feel like you have some relationship with the person who wrote the book. And I, I think writing in your own voice is an important way to do it. It makes it feel authentic. You know, just like Absolutely. if you're watching a video and someone is robotically speaking, you don't really feel that that's them, you know, and you want to know who right. it is. So for intermittent fasting, I'm a big fan of it. I do it myself and I advocate it. And I tell you, it all started, a friend of mine, he's a radiation oncologist. He's a doctor who uh, uh, takes care of people of cancer with radiation. And he's the head of a, uh, the, the department in this major hospital in Florida. And we were childhood friends. I've known him a long time. And I remember a couple of years ago, he called me up and he's like, hey, do you know about this anti-aging medicine? And I was like, what the heck are you talking about? You know, and he's like, no, seriously, there's this thing, anti-aging medicine. I, you know, I didn't believe it. I thought he was just making it up. You know, sometimes he has <laughs> things to say. But he's like, no, I'm not kidding. And he's he said, you can go to all these different journals. And if you look up these different things, and he gave me stuff to look up, you'll find thousands of articles on this. It's a real thing. So I started researching this a couple of years ago, and it is a real thing. And and so we kind of have a better understanding now that we have some control over aging. It's not just some kind of passive process that happens to us and every year we kind of fall closer to the cliff. You know, it's, it's actually, we have control over this. And so there's different things we can do to kind of slow the aging process. And so one of the best of them is intermittent fasting. And there's a lot of benefits to it. I mean, one of the best, I think, is this anti-aging stuff, but also it's great for weight control. And I've talked to a lot of people and I've had patients who've told me this. In fact, I had this lady, she was telling me, she's, she was like 70 pounds overweight, but she's, you know, she's active and she's smart and she's professionally successful, but she just couldn't lose weight. And she tried, you know, this diet and that diet and nothing really worked. But then I got her to try intermittent fasting and she lost weight. And I find a lot of people, they have a hard time controlling what they eat. You know, you have certain cravings for certain foods and maybe you could stop it for a day or two, but it just, ultimately these cravings are gonna beat out. They're just too strong. So a lot of people don't have much control over what they eat, but surprisingly, people have more control over when they eat. And it may not seem this way, but I've heard it over and over again. If you love pizza and I walk in the door and I say, hey, you know, don't eat pizza anymore because it's bad for you. You know, maybe you'll do it for a day or two but then you'll say that guy's a quack, forget it, I'm gonna eat pizza. <laughs> but if I tell you, you could eat pizza but only eat it from the hours of say 12 to six and not any other time, you could probably do that. And, and so it turns out that this is true for most people. I mean, there's no dietary rule that everybody could follow, right? You know, everybody's a little different. But it turns out that for most people, it's easier to control when you eat than what you eat. So the trick with intermittent fasting, and there's different ways to do it, but the trick with it is you just limit the window of the day that you could eat. And so most people, it's a window of like six hours or eight hours. You know, again, there's different ways to do it. So say you're fasting for... 16 hours and you're eating for eight, which is the most common way. It's called the 16-8 fast. What you would do is you'd finish dinner by 8 p.m. Then you don't eat any more food that day and you go to bed. So your sleep time counts as part of your fast. And then you don't eat breakfast in the morning. That's the skip breakfast thing. And then you eat lunch at noon. And if you do that, which is easy, you fasted for 16 hours and, and you're just eating for eight. And the reason why this works is you're only eating during a small period of time. So it's just harder to cram a bunch of food in, in your mouth, you know, during this limited period <laughs> of time. And you're just not as hungry and you're doing other things during that time too. It's not like you're just in the kitchen during those eight hours, you're working and doing other things. 
So you naturally eat less and, and, and it works. And, and so that's a big thing. But the one thing about fasting I wanna say for people listening and they're interested in this is obviously like with anything else, I recommend you speak to your doctor first before you do something because there may be something about your situation that makes this not work. And number two, you don't wanna get dehydrated. So when you're fasting, you could drink water, you could drink black coffee, you could drink tea and herbal tea. Uh, you can drink sparkling waters, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, so the goal is not to get dehydrated. You just don't eat stuff with calories. Yeah, I mean, okay, so Dr. Greg, I gotta say, this is the information that you provided in the book like made my whole intermittent fasting process a lot easier because it's something that I, I teach to clients, the former athletes when I'm working with. And I know this isn't just about athletes. This is about anybody. Like you said, you're, that woman you're working with was able to shed pounds just by incorporating eating in that small window. Uh, when I read your book, I was already doing intermittent fasting, but it was a challenge for me because you know I'm a coffee drinker. So I would always, but I don't like to drink coffee too late. you know. And I, I also know that you're not really like the caffeine, you know this, you could probably speak to this better than me, but that caffeine has a long, uh, what do you call it, like half-life? Is that what you, and, and so like it can affect your sleep if you're drinking past noon. So I'm like, okay, well, I want to have this window where I stop eating at seven and then I want to have some breakfast and have some coffee, but I'm going to try to push it at least till around like 11. That way I'm hitting my 16 hours, but I, I only have that hour between 11 to 12 to drink the coffee because I was putting all kinds of stuff in it, creamer or whatever. Versus when I read your book, you said, no, you can have coffee, just drink black coffee. So now I'm able to push my fast a lot further because I can drink black coffee from the time that I wake up, up until, you know, before that noon cutoff. And I still don't need to eat. Uh, even sparkling water, like that was a, a game changer for me because it kind of fills you up a little bit. So thanks to your book, I've been able to really like stretch it. And I know that there's obviously a lot of physical uh, benefits to intermittent fasting, but can you speak to the, the, uh, the cognitive function? Like I, I noticed an increase in cognitive function when I don't have food in my system so early in the morning. Yeah. And you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I wrote almost all of my book while fasting, you know, because I, <laughs> wow. I mean, I'm a morning person anyways, you know, but I'm like you, you know, I, I like to have coffee in the morning and, and, and I like black coffee anyway. So for me, it worked out great. Um, and it's kind of fun because you taste the coffee more. So if you're, you know, I love trying different coffees and once you put a bunch of crap in it, you don't really taste the coffee anyways. When you have black coffee, it's kind of fun because you can try different beans and different roasts and different things. And it kind of makes it interesting because you actually taste what you're, you know, what you're having. I mean, if you're a wine drinker and you cut your wine with a bunch of milk, or which sounds gross, but if you cut your wine with a bunch of whatever, like you're not really tasting the wine, you might as well have two buck chuck, you know, every time. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with them. Good old but, two buck chuck. <laughs> yeah, not, 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 not casting any judgment on two buck chuck here. <laughs> But, but the cognitive stuff, I agree, you know, and I, and I found this, and a lot of people have found this, is that you tend to think better if you are fasted. And that's because, and you found this, you know, if you eat a big meal, like that pizza, you know, you, it's, it, you're sleepy afterwards. Your body is kind of redirecting your, your energy towards digesting the pizza that's in your stomach now. And so, your brain is kind of on the back burner because you're trying to digest this pizza. And I, I like to give an example. You have to think about how we evolved, right? And so our ancestors were not eating every second of the day, right? There, there was no refrigerator. They didn't have snacks. You know, there was no processed food. They couldn't just go to the grocery store. They ate food when they had it. So if they found a, a, a meal, like let's say they, they killed a deer or something, or they found a beehive or whatever, or they found some fruit, they ate it all then, and then they moved on. So our ancestors sort of gorged and then fasted, and that's the way we evolved. Now, when you think about it, if you were designing humans, when would you want their mental acuity to be the best? Right when they've eaten, when they're fat and happy after eating that deer, or when they're starving a little bit and they need to eat. If you were designing us, you would make us sharpest when we're starving a little bit and we need to eat because that way we're really vigilant. We're looking for the next meal. Like we're on our A game because we know if eventually we don't eat, we're gonna starve to death. 
So if you were designing humans, you would make it so we are we think the most clearly when we're a little bit hungry, and that that's and and we're still that way now. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy, Dr. Greg, because it really puts it in perspective that you want to be in that starving state so you can go hunt for your meal. And although, of course, not, I mean, most of us listening to this aren't out actually hunting for animals to eat, but <laughs> we're, we're in our life hunting for, you know, whatever it is that we're looking to accomplish in the world and our missions. So that's a great analogy. I, I, I really do uh, resonate with that where I wake up and I'm like, I need to stay hungry almost, you know, like physically, but also also like mentally hungry so that I can execute on the things that I need to do for that day or for that week or for that month. And it's crazy because I remember when I was in college, you know, we would have, we would be filled up before games. And, you know, of course they encourage you to carb load and eat the pasta and all that. And I always used to wonder, or just feel so like guilty, like, is there something wrong with me? Like I have a game right now and I'm sitting here in my locker about to fall asleep because I just ate three plates of pasta. And uh, I think, (laughs) you know, uh, hopefully there's some coaches or something listening to this, like maybe they could say, don't starve your players before the game, but, you know, at least they'll have them eat a bunch of pasta and stuff, you know. Um, Have you seen, like, when you're working with athletes, have you found that there's a lot of, I guess, myths or things that you have to kind of debunk when you're talking to them or kind of like a paradigm shift as far as their eating habits or just their overall health in general? Well, you know, it's interesting you say that. And this is, remember I told you, like I kind of got introduced to athletes just a couple of years ago. And mm-hmm. I had always assumed that every athlete kind of had their own nutritionist and that, you know, they were eating like these scientific, you know, th- as a lay person, you just assume that like every athlete is getting the best advice out there about what to eat and when and everything else. And you assume that they have like a diet that's structured for them. Like, it just seems like that's how it would be. But I found out for most people, it isn't, you know, most people like either the athletes are kind of left on their own or the coach just has some kind of plan, or maybe there's one dietitian who covers, you know, like a hundred people or something. And so I, it occurred to me that like people weren't getting the best advice they could be. Maybe LeBron James does, you know, but most people are not. And so, right. and so the thing is, and the one thing I want to say is that that the needs of active professional athletes or say active college athletes are different than the needs of say a 40 year old former football player. And, and this is one of the big things. And so the whatever dietary habits you got in when you were playing football, even if they work for you at the time are not the right dietary habits for you now that you're 43 and you're an accountant. You know, it's just, right. it's a different ball game. And so what you need to eat has to change. But, but even for active athletes, like you, you know, like you were asking about, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what active athletes should eat. Now, I, I wanna say, I don't necessarily advocate fasting in most situations for active athletes. I think it could be good for training. And this is a whole like another topic, which is very exciting. But, but on game day, I, I don't think I'd have an active athlete fast. But, 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 but it is true that the types of food you eat and what you eat and when has a big effect on your athletic performance. And, and you know, it's interesting when you look at basketball, for example, I mean, tell me if you've noticed this. In the third quarter, you know, teams that come out of the locker room and they're often flat. Mm-hmm. And they, they, you know, the beginning of the third quarter, teams often play very poorly. And you would think to yourself, well, why is that? You would think it would be the opposite. You would think, you know, they've had a little rest, they were refreshed, they got a pep talk, they had this new strategy, you know, that the coaches gave them. So you think that they would come out, you know, hitting the ground running at the beginning of the third quarter. But that isn't what usually happens. And it's because they're not eating the right stuff, you know, and they're, they're drinking a bunch of sugar, you know, in, in the form of Gatorade and stuff at the beginning of halftime. And so now they're in this crash. And so there's a lot of scientific things that you could actually do to help active athletes perform better. And, and you're right, like eating a bunch of carbs at the wrong time is, 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 is you know, is, is like a cold blanket on performance. Right, yeah. It's crazy because like, like you said, you would think that, especially on an elite level, like professional athletes, you would think that all of these bases would be covered or that this is common knowledge, but it's not, which is why I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that your message, like anybody listening, this is why this man has been on Fox and, you know, CBS, like, this is why, because this man is really putting in, like, 
work and putting out a powerful message. And I want to talk a little bit about like the future of what you're doing. Cause like you said, at the beginning, you and I are a lot alike where we have our hands in a bunch of different things. Um, what is what is the future for Dr. Gregory Charlotte? Like, what is what is your end game? I love to ask people like, what is this big picture that they're working towards? You know. So you know, I'll tell you a story. I I was talking to another anesthesiologist the other day. We we ran into each other, and she's done all kinds of crazy stuff. She uh, did this like wellness stuff with um, ketamine, like this kind of mood and depression stuff. And now she's getting involved with this group that's treating people with like mushrooms and things for to kind of improve their performance and, and their mood. I haven't done anything like that. But she also worked with this, this incredibly wealthy family that flew around on helicopters to different places because someone in the family required special medical care. And she's spoken at some of the top conferences about kind of mindfulness and, and thinking properly. And I asked her, well, how did you get to do this? Like, how did you get into all these situations? Because these are really cool. You know, like a lot of us would kill to do the stuff that she did. And she said, the key to my success is I always made myself available when things came up. Mm. You know, so if something came up, I would say yes to it. And I didn't tie myself down to too many things that took a lot of continuous time commitment that would prevent me from saying yes to stuff. I made it so I could say yes to things when they were available. And so like one thing led to another. And so because she was able to say yes to interesting opportunities that come up, she did all this cool stuff. And so that kind of resonated with me. And I kind of feel the same way. I think what you want to do is you want to put as hard work in as you can, learn as much as you can, help as many people as you can, but you want to be in the position where if something interesting comes up that you could say yes to it. Because those interesting things only come up here and there, and you don't know when the next interesting thing is going to be. And if you're constantly tied down, you know, working for the man every second, it's hard to say yes when, that, when, when, when your shot arrives. So to answer your question, I, I'm ready to say yes to something and, and kind of just, you know, I, I'm open to kind of seeing where life goes. Yeah. And the cool thing about it is that you're kind of already ahead of your time with what you're doing, because you and I were talking about this. You were doing telemedicine way before COVID hit. So you were already ahead of the game. Like, hey, I should be able to help a patient any anywhere at any given time. And obviously there's been an uptick in that because of what's going on in the world. But pre-COVID, that was something you were already doing, you know? Um, so I guess like a better question would be, what do you want your legacy to be? Like when it's all said and done, you know, and this is, you know, you already got two books, one on real estate, one on anti-aging, or do you see yourself more so like really going down the path of, of anti-aging so people can live their best lives? Or like you said, I know you're open to a million other things, but what would you want your, your legacy to be ultimately when it's, when it's all over? Well, you know, I want people to realize, I mean, my big message is, I want people to realize that you have control over your own health and destiny. Mm. You don't have to follow a standard career path just because everybody else did, or that's kind of maybe what your parents did or something. You don't have to follow a certain path where you kind of, you're young and you're vigorous in your 20s and your 30s, you're all right. And then in your 40s, you're in this decline. You know, you don't have to follow these standard pathways because other people did or society expects you to do. I, I think if I could leave someone with a message, it would be that you have control over your own destiny more than you think in terms of your job. I mean, not that I, I talk too much about jobs, but I just from my own experience of having changed jobs a lot. But I think in terms of health, you know, by by making the right choices in what you eat and when you eat and exercise and intentionally having gratitude, you know, intentionally being thankful when things happen and by getting enough sleep, when you make the right choices, you have a lot more control over your health than you think. And I think if I could leave anyone with that message, it's that, you know, it's, it's not that in a few years from now, it's inevitable that you'll be overweight or it's inevitable that you'll be tired or it's inevitable that you'll have wrinkly skin. You have control over this. And I think if I had one message, it would be that, you know, take the bull by the horns and feel some ownership over yourself because 
you can lead yourself in the right direction. Wow. That was, that was well said, Dr. Greg. And I feel like that's one of the things I like about you most is that you're an out of the box thinker because it's not just, it's not like you're someone who just stays in your lane of, I just give medical advice. Like you branch off and you're talking about like your life path. You know what I mean? Like you have agency over your own life. I think that's a powerful right. message that, that people need to hear because it's so much deeper than just being healthy. It's about your life ultimately. And how you take care of yourself is a reflection of just your life path in general. So I'm really happy that you spoke on that. Um, and people need to like, just follow up with you and, and learn where they can connect with you. Because obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning, retiredathletehealth.com, but you also have Gregory Charlotte, MD.com, which is like a hub for everything that you're doing. Uh, you're putting out so much great content. Like the one you had the other day, I really appreciate it. I think this was like last week or a week or two where you were talking about vitamin C. Um, can you, you were talking about how, cause right now there's so many people they tell you to take vitamin C and zinc to protect yourself from the virus, right? Um, and you took a deep dive into if you're someone who's an athlete or a former athlete and you're doing a lot of training, there's a certain uh, effect that vitamin C has on your body. Matter of fact, can you go into that? Because I thought that, that was really cool. I didn't know that before, before I saw your video. Yeah, and, and speaking, if I could do a one second shameless self-promotion, I just started a Please do. page. <laughs> and so, it, you know, I, if you check it out, just Google Gregory Charlotte Wellness MD. Uh, go check it. I'd love to have you subscribe and, and give me feedback about the videos since I'd like to hear from you and know what you think. And you could share your own experiences. I like learning from other people's experiences. So, so look for me on YouTube. I'm new to it and I would love to have people check it out. But you're right. You know, it's interesting. And this is why I think the athlete community is not well served right now is because there's even something as simple as vitamin C, which sounds great and everybody loves it it's good for some people and not for others. And you're right, if you're middle age and you're not an active athlete or you're a senior, you definitely should be taking vitamin C. I take vitamin C and it may help protect you from COVID to some degree. It may offer some benefit. Uh, we don't know for sure, but it's not gonna hurt and it might help. And it's good for your skin and your eyes and other things. But, uh, but if you're an active athlete, a pro athlete, a, a college athlete, someone really competitive, the vitamin C might actually hurt you, excess vitamin C, so vitamin C supplements. I'm not saying don't eat like an orange or something. Don't, you know, don't put pieces <laughs> right. But vitamin C supplements, and here's the thing. When you exercise, like if you go to the gym and you lift weights and you're, you're curling, let's say, and you're stressing your bicep. The reason you're doing that is you're, you're causing, you want your bicep to be under stress and your bicep says, oh crap, you know, I need to get stronger because I have all this work to do and I'm not up to the task. So the reason you're curling these weights is you're trying to send a message to your bicep that, listen, you need to like get with the program and toughen up by stressing mm -hmm. it, right? Your biceps aren't getting bigger when you're on the couch watching Netflix that are getting bigger when you're stressing them. And so... Once your biceps are stressed, they have a little bit of inflammation and they have a little bit of breakdown. And that is what sends the message that they need to get bigger. So vitamin C is very anti-inflammatory, which sounds great, you know, who wants inflammation? But if you're trying to stress your biceps to get them bigger, but you're hitting them with a strong anti-inflammatory drug, vitamin C, it makes it so your workouts aren't doing what you want them to do. It makes it so your, your, your biceps aren't getting stressed, they're not gonna get as strong. And so there's quite a bit of evidence now that when, when athletes, again, I'm talking about like, like hardcore athletes, you know, like professionals, pro, like people who are really serious. When they take vitamin C supplements, their training and their athletic performance suffers. And that's because they're not building up as much as they should be because the, the anti-inflammatory effect of the vitamin C works against what you're trying to do in the gym. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a, like, once again, just dropping bombs on me, dropping knowledge that I didn't, I hadn't even considered it before. It's like, so now I'm kind of like strategic when I take vitamin C, when I take the supplement and I'll usually do it later at night with a meal versus like, you know, before I go lift weights or something, like almost while I'm in recovery mode, uh, as opposed to having vitamin C in my system as I'm working out. I think that that's a uh, kind of a better approach. I don't know. I, I should be asking you, do you think that that's a better way for me to go about it? Well, you know, so it's interesting at the end of the day, and this is one of the big things with nutrition, at the end of the mm -hmm. day, you need to figure out what are your main priorities? 
Right. Now, if your main priority is, is, is health and maybe not getting COVID and fighting off wrinkles and stuff like that, there's a bunch of stuff you should do like fasting, taking vitamin C. There is a number of other supplements like nicotinamide, riboside, things like that, that I would tell you should take. But if you said to me, you know, I'm a 20 year old college basketball player right now, you know, I don't care about, you know, whether I'm not worried particularly about getting Alzheimer's when I'm 80 right now, I want to get picked in the NBA draft. I would tell you don't fast, don't take vitamin C supplements, don't take, you know, nicotinamide riboside, take these other things instead. And I would, I would steer you in a different direction. So I think, you know, the, ultimately with nutrition and with supplements and with all this stuff, the big question is what are your goals? How old are you? Mm -hmm. What are you trying to accomplish? Stuff like that. And I think where medicine and, and I think particularly where nutrition has gone wrong is we come up with these kind of one size fits all things and we try to apply it to everybody. But your needs and my needs are different based on kind of where we are in life and everything else. Like I, I like working out and I lift weights, but I know I'm never gonna be a competitive athlete. I never was a competitive athlete. I mean, I like it, you know, but I never was a competitive. I just don't have the stuff for it, you know? And so I lift weights mostly to kind of keep my health up and, you know, to look good in, in these tight polo shirts I wear for these interviews. <laughs> and And so, for me, like I, I take vitamin C and I, I don't worry about whether it impacts my workouts or not. You know, if it has some little impact on my workout, I, I can live with that, you know, but, but maybe for you, the situation's a little different, you know, and so, and so that's why I think it's very important to have like individualized stuff. Right, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I know we've been spending a lot of time talking about athletes or former athletes or current athletes. And that's, you know, me, the conversation always ends up going in that direction, but, um, we talked about COVID earlier, right? And I think now would be a good time to just get some tips or any insights you may have, because of course we hear all the talk about stay home and wear your mask and all that stuff, but I don't hear a lot of talk about preventative maintenance and things you can do to boost your immune system and all that type of stuff. So can you just give some advice to the listeners about how not only aside from staying indoors and wearing your mask when you're out, but how can you build up your own immune system and make sure you stay protected if you do come in contact with the virus or anything else for that matter? Yeah, and I, I love this topic, actually. And, and this is something that isn't talked about that much. I mean, obviously, your main goal is to not catch it, right? But, right. but here's the thing, and this is true for all viruses. Even if I took, say, HIV, if you took the HIV virus and you had one HIV virus and you injected that one virus into somebody, that person would not get HIV because you need to have a certain amount of the viral exposure before you get sick. Now, how much you need and how much I need might be different, but we all need more than one. We need a certain quantity. And a lot of that depends on how strong your immune system is when you're exposed. Because what happens is when you're exposed to a small amount of something, your immune system is strong enough that you will fight it off. If you're exposed to a huge amount of something, your immune system will get overrun, right? But if you're exposed to a moderate amount, the stronger your immune system is, the more protected you'll be. And this is true from, from, for lots of things like the cold, the flu, COVID, everything else. And, and so in addition to not getting exposed, you wanna figure out how could you make your immune system as strong as possible? So if you get some mild exposure to it, that you don't get sick, you know? I mean, if someone with COVID is standing in front of you and you're not wearing a mask and they're not wearing a mask and they cough in your face, you're gonna get it. And I don't care you know, how much sleep you get and I don't care you know, how much vitamin C you take, you're gonna get it. But if you're in the bank and someone with COVID is on the other side of the bank as you are and they're coughing, whether you get it or not, maybe based on your shape, you know, how good right. your immune system is and everything. So I want to make it so if you're in the bank with someone else and they're coughing over there in the corner and you're waiting for the teller, you're not going to catch it. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have too much data specific to COVID, but we have data for other viruses that are similar. And it's probably true for COVID too. And one of the best things you could do is get enough sleep. Mm -hmm. And there's been some really cool studies that when you sleep deprive people, even just a couple hours, they're much more likely to get sick from viruses similar to COVID. 
I mean, it's dramatic. So someone who sleeps, say, five, five and a half hours is much more likely to get sick from a similar virus than someone who sleeps eight. Right. I mean, by, by many times. And so, so one of the big tips I give to people is you need to get enough sleep. And this is true for a lot of reasons, but it's especially true for COVID. And it bothers me because I think in our society today, we almost wear sleep deprivation as like this badge of honor, you know, like, mm. I'm so tough, you know, I only slept four hours because I did all this work and I did this and I did that. You're putting yourself at risk and you may be talking tough, but you're putting yourself at risk and you're not going to be talking that tough when you're hospitalized with some illness that you didn't need to get. Mm, let them know. You hear that? Are you team no sleep people out there? <laughs> right. That's right. So, so getting enough sleep is, I would say, would be number one. The other thing is, you know, we, there are some nutrients that may reduce your risk. Again, we don't know for sure if this is true with COVID, but it's true for similar things. So zinc, like you said, may reduce your risk. Vitamin C, vitamin D may reduce your risk. Magnesium might reduce your risk. I take all of those. And then eating, you know, healthy meals. So eating a lot of vegetables, you know, the stuff you would think would be good for you is, is seems to be good with you for viral protection also. So, so your healthy lifestyle choices actually make a difference even, even for things like COVID. Right. Yeah. I mean, see, this is why you guys got to get the book, folks. Why doctors skip breakfast. Not only that, but I forgot to read the subtitle earlier because you were just talking about sleep. I forgot to include the subtitle of the book is Wellness Tips to Reverse Aging, Treat Depression, and Get a Good Night's Sleep. And I love that you touched on that because that's some stuff that I'm really heavy on. Like when I'm talking to anyone and even my, even myself, I've been a lot more intentional about getting a good night's sleep because I really do understand the impact that that has. And like you said, people wear like a badge of honor where you're going through the day. You might as well be going through the day drunk if you're off four hours of sleep. Or, or less because you're not really operating at the highest level you could be. So, I mean, that was, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Gray. You got so many gems. All this stuff is inside the book. Please tell people how they can get in touch with you, uh, where they can find out more about your content, where they can get the book, all that stuff. Yeah, so the book is available as paperback and Kindle, and you can get it from Amazon. Just look for Why Doctors Skip Breakfast. It's also available on Audible. So if you're a listener, and that's actually how I get most of my books is from Audible. Um, it's available there. And then if you want to get in touch with me, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So you can look for me there. I'm on Facebook, uh, but LinkedIn is probably one of my favorite things. Or my website, Gregory Charlop, M-D, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y-C-H-A-R-L-O-P-M-D.com or retiredathletehealth.com. And then look for me on YouTube because I'm new and I want to get feedback and I want to hear from you guys. So I'm pushing that. <laughs> look for me on YouTube. That's awesome. Well, thank you for coming on and sharing, Dr. Greg. This is one of those episodes, like I said at the beginning, you know, people got to tap in and maybe listen to it a few times and have the notepad ready because this is essentially like a, a consultation if you're listening to this. And I know I was being selfish and asking my own questions, but that's only because I'm gonna take advantage of this. This is a free consultation, you know? So aside from the book, I already got so much great info from you. You're putting out great information every day. Every time I look up, you have a video that just, you know, I didn't even know that, you know? I'm, I wouldn't have known it if I didn't come across your work. So I'm super grateful that we connected. Um, I appreciate all the great work that you do, not just for athletes, but for the population in general, especially at a time that we're living in right now where, you know, your health and well-being needs to be at the forefront. So, um, yeah, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for coming on and sharing. And uh, we may be neighbors soon. I may see you in Texas as soon as I get on out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for having me on. And uh, if you come out, let me know. I will show you around. I would love to. I would love to. All right, Dr. Greg. This has been a great episode of Author Spotlight with Dr. Gregory Charlotte. Please tune in. All the information to connect with him will be in the show notes. And we'll see you on the very next episode.